they made it outside to the fresh early morning air. And here is where they're greeted with a new sight. Dozens of soldiers. The National Guard had arrived. In addition to the National Guard, a new figure was joining the story, Henry Carmichael. Now, Carmichael was the general superintendent of the Kentucky Rock Asphalt Company. He had been on site since Tuesday, and he was appalled at how primitive the rescue attempt had been. Shortly after Miller and Kirk had executed, Carmichael sent two men into Sand Cave to assess the structure's stability. They soon came back with a report. It was not good. Near the final squeeze, large cracks had formed. The ceiling was beginning to droop. Right, so the following is a recounting of events from one of Carmichael's men, Casey Jones. <clears throat> Casey and another worker spent about an hour in the cave, surveying the condition, looking at the board, the ceiling, the stability of the walls. He continued deeper towards Floyd. He was fighting against his nerves. The shifting of the rock pinged his every instinct to flee. But he heard Collins moaning ahead, so he pushed himself on. He managed to make it through the squeeze and he arrived at the 10-foot pit. Seeing Floyd trapped, he tried to ignore the pebbles that were tumbling behind him. Please, I'm down. Uh, I just can't right now, Floyd. I will when I get back. Behind Casey, his partner is begging to leave. Below Casey, Collins is pleading for help. Put the foot over here! I'm so thirsty. Okay. Casey slid head first into the pit and hastily ladled Floyd some coffee. Floyd rejected it. The rumbling intensified from above. And in that moment, Casey realized that this was not a plea for sustenance. Floyd knew that a haven was inevitable. Scared and approaching his fifth day trapped, he was completely at his wit's end. He knew he was about to be trapped in that cave, and he didn't want to be trapped alone. Stay with me, please. Don't leave. Casey looked into Colin's eyes, set the coffee down, and pulled himself out of the bed. He wiggled underneath the sagging ceiling and crawled towards the turnaround room as fast as his limbs could scramble against the cave walls. He looked back to see the passage closing like a maw. Reflections from the bulb shining around Floyd's neck were no longer visible. Instead, just sobs could be heard, muffled from behind the rocks. Miller and Burden awoke in the late morning, confident that today would be the day that they saved Floyd. They had some new equipment too, some wire to wrap around the wooden blocks to prevent them from slipping. And they changed their mind about that acetylene torch. They'll use it to burn away two rocks that had previously blocked their way. But when Miller got to the turnaround room, all of that optimism left him. The entrance to the squeeze was now just a pile of debris. Miller froze, staring at it for a long while. Then he sighed and did the only thing he could think attempt to move some of the stones. But each adjustment led to more rocks just tumbling down and landing in that space. He persisted until... Crash. A large chunk of clay landed onto his feet. Recognising the danger, Miller returned to the surface. Fifteen minutes later, he emerged from the cave with a bloodied up nose and bruises down his back and shoulders. Burden caught sight and races over to him. Miller just says, for God's sake, just don't let Homer or anyone else back in there. Now, he didn't actually need to worry about Homer going back in there because he was sidelined with illness. But he did, however, need to worry about Gerald because he was furious. Gerald had warned everyone that putting dozens of people in Sand Cave would cause a collapse. It certainly did. The rest of that day would be wasted as men threw blame around and screamed at each other about how to handle the cave -in. And Floyd spent the rest of that day alone. The surveyors continued checking the cave throughout the day. By the evening, Carmichael had ordered everyone to an assembly. Gerald took the floor. He was going to try one last daring risk. He boldly announced his plan 
and an ultimate. Listen up! There's death down there. The walls and ceilings are crumbling. Unless you're determined to take the biggest chance you ever took in your life, tell me now and stay outside. Next, they told all the Gorkas to get the fuck out of the cave, clear off. And over the next eight hours, Gerald would enter and leave the sand cave at least five times, chipping away at that pile of brick. In the woods, men sawed trees and chopped logs to shore up the cave walls. Underground, the crew reinforced cracks and wobbling boulders with fresh strips of wood. Gerald assessed that about four barrels of rocks would need to be moved, and piece by piece they made that happen. Steadily, they managed to move enough rock to allow Gerald to get within earshot of Floyd. Bad news! We can't reach you, but hold on, we're coming! Stone by stone, they continued. After a few hours, the light of the bolt around Floyd's neck was peeking through. A couple more hours, enough room for Gerald to squeeze through. Okay, that's enough. Floyd, I'm going for now. But when I get back, I'm gonna get you out of there. Exhausted but still determined, Gerald crawled back up the cave and marched to the men huddling outside. Gather the equipment, and in an hour's time, it's gonna be me and Floyd coming out of that cave. Gerald entered Sand Cave for his final time. The walls had been reinforced, but mud and water was accumulating everywhere. He waded through it and pressed on past the danger of the sagging ceiling. With determination on his face and a grease gun clutched in his right hand, he scrambled towards Floyd. But before the final squeeze, he stopped. It was all gone. The cave ceiling had crumbled once again. Gerald stared motionlessly at the pile. Then he began to yell. Floyd! A rock disconnected from the ceiling and tumbled onto Gerald's head. Luckily, just a small one. He rubbed his scalp and called out again. Floyd! This time, a moan. It rumbled from the other side. Fearing that his friend was slipping out of consciousness, Gerald willed himself against the cave, launching the debris behind him with force. He ignored the pain from being struck on the head and clawed at the stone pile. He carried on this way for several minutes, until a sharp, heavy rock dropped from the ceiling and landed squarely on his back. No more than 15 minutes later, Gerald returned to the surface. Defeated. Only after the cave ins did they start to think about all of the things that they could have done. Wait, why didn't we rig a portable telephone line? That would have been incredibly simple here in 1925. Yeah, why have we been running in and out to deliver updates? Why didn't we give him an AM radio? He could have had something to listen to and receive messages of support from the public. Wait, why don't we rig up a tarpaulin so we could lift his torso up so he wouldn't be slowly dying of exposure? Oh god, why didn't we run a feeding tube? That's also a technology we have in 1925. All too long. Now, the one route to get to Floyd is closed forever. That meant two options. Number one, capitulation. Surrender him to the cave. Or number two, Dig down from directly above Floyd. Now the prospect of digging from above seemed almost fanciful. At least it did in the beginning. But luckily, they had some help. Owing to Miller's report, Floyd had become practically the most famous person in the country. The rescue had become a high priority for the governor of Kentucky, Lieutenant General Denhart enters the scene. He's been updated on the situation and following shortly behind him is a small army of miners and engineers. He declared to the despondent crowd, Gentlemen, I am here on behalf of the governor. The purse strings of Kentucky are open. Take this blank check and bring that man out alive. Floyd in that cold, wet confine could not have imagined the scale of the operation that was going on 55 feet above him. 
Authorities assumed control of Colin's wrist. Dinhart gave Henry Carmichael the lead to dig, and Carmichael raced to get to work. He enlisted his employees, his fleet of expensive high-tech machinery. Professional groups were brought in from all across the state. Local townspeople were mostly excluded, and for the first time since Collins had been trapped, work was now about to go ahead in a systematic way. Everyone knew the plan, everyone had something to do, and everyone was working fast. But just as hopes were rising, they were once again dashed against the rocks. They had all of this state-of-the-art machinery shipped in and assembled by the engineers and rearing to go. And it was all worthless. See, the problem is the cave drew air into it. These diesel-powered engines pumped out enormous volumes of choking exhaust. Within a day's operation, the cave would be filled with carbon monoxide and Floyd would be dead from asphyxiation. Just as quickly as solutions would arise, the cave would parry them away. It refused to let this man go. So engineers and miners had wasted hours assembling everything, only to realize that they had to pack it all up and cart it. Because the digging of a 55-foot shaft would be done with picks and shovels. Carmichael didn't know much about caves, but he knew a lot about quarrying, and he estimated that his team of 75 volunteers could dig and dredge at a rate of two feet per hour. If they worked around the clock, they would be digging directly into the spot where Floyd lays within 30 hours. Now, was it possible that Floyd could survive for another 30 hours? Absolutely. Let's go. The first ton was moved, and at first, it was easy work. Just dirt and clay. Carmichael understood well that this was a race against time, so he watched the men closely, and if they seemed to be slowing down, even a little, they would be yanked out, and immediately a new worker subbed in. Nonetheless, the pace slowed. By 10 feet, the shaft narrowed greatly, which meant that only two men could work at a time. At 15 feet, they hit boulders, pickaxes the and hit, and a system of pulleys and buckets had to be used to cart the rock out. Tracks were even laid to ferry the refuse to a dump site. Time passed. Hours passed. Night went to day. The day was hot. This was yet another problem, because it's early February, there's tons of ice still in the ground, and its exposure to the fresh midday sun meant that the walls of the shaft were softening and the ground became sodden. The pace of digging slowed. It was now only half a foot per hour. Most anyone could do was watch helplessly on the sidelines and pray. Interestingly though, there were a lot of people on the sidelines. Floyd wouldn't have believed that the space above him had turned into a literal carnival in his honor. Vendors showed up to sell hamburgers, hot dogs, and souvenirs. Families sprawled out over blankets to listen to hymns from local church groups. The local mountebanks sold moonshine and miracle cures. There was even a bloody juggler. And old man Lee was there, walking around, shaking his jar, and soliciting donations. But where were Homer and Jordan and Miller during all this? Okay, let's back up a bit. People did not properly understand exactly how Floyd was trapped, and the news didn't help much either. So the obvious question started to arise. Why hasn't he been rescued yet? Just clear some gravel or pull a rope. How is this so hard? Motive was attributed. I heard they didn't even want to have him rescued at all. I heard that they're doing all of this for publicity. And Lee's activity of soliciting donations, remember from before, further inflamed rumours. I bet Ford isn't even trapped in there. These were all real rumours, and they got worse. You know what? I heard he comes out at night, and then he just goes back in in the morning. Other rumours included... I heard that after Floyd went into the cave, someone murdered him. Others said... I think they're withholding food and water from him, so he dies. This whole thing is a fraud. 
As time went on, it was harder and harder to ignore the hoax claims. Then, people started to form righteous mobs, claiming the whole thing was a fraud, and they started to get nasty. In fact, two people even went to the telegraph office and pretended to be Floyd sending telegrams to his mother. Here's what it said. Quote, Please contradict statements that I am buried alive in Sand Cave. Stop. Tell mother I am all right. Stop. Am coming home. Stop. Floyd Collins. Naturally, the AP published these telegrams unquestioningly, and now word is out to the press that he isn't actually in the cave after all. That made the authorities look foolish, and it could not go on. So, a hasty court martial was arranged, and Homer, Miller, and Gerald were summoned. They hold one session on Monday and another on Tuesday. Lee and everyone else is cleared of charges, a retraction is written, and things carry on. Generators rumbled, pumps churned out water, men continued working in ships and carrying away the earth. Here they are with strips of lumber to shore up the wall. They were only 25 feet down. The pace had slowed to four inches per hour. In their desperation, they resorted to dynamite. But this did little to the boulders. Despite all these bleak circumstances, people's spirits were high because everyone was keen for their turn to dig. And because they had one more thing to latch on to. He is probably still alive. Now, how do they know that? Okay, so remember that light bulb around Floyd's neck? Well, it's powered by a simple copper wire. Their copper wire is subject to very minute fluctuations in resistance. So, an engineer rigs up a radio amplifier to this wire to read the current and see those small fluctuations. There they were. About 20 per minute, the rate of steady breathing. As his chest expands and contracts, they can read it from this device. And so, they kept going. And going. And going. 30 hours was the original estimate. Now 144 hours had come and gone and they were only at 44 feet. Then rain fell. Rain that mixed with dirt to make mud. Much of which then froze to make ice. Ice which expanded and damaged the integrity of the shaft walls. Slowing down with every hour, they continued. Many more hours passed and they were getting close. But it was now 15 days since Floyd was first stuck in that cave and people had mostly lost hope. That excitement in the newspapers was tempering down. Visitors began clearing out from Cave City. Many still held on to hope, but their final lifeline, that light bulb, had burnt out. And it wasn't possible to do any more readings on the radio amplifier without it. No one knew if Floyd was still alive. Another 51 hours would pass before, finally, they reached the 60-foot depth. I'm in. Chisel. A chisel is handed down. At 1.30 p.m. on Monday, February 16th, Sand Cave would open once again. For 17 days, Floyd had been trapped underground, stuck in the same position. Four days without heat or light. Twelve without food or water. But maybe the dripping of the cave water had provided him with some sustenance? There are stories of people surviving harsher extremes. Rescuers frantically tugged at rocks to widen the hole. Everybody stood by, absolutely silent, peering into that hole. Ed flashed his light into the gap, then eased himself in. Brenner aimed his light around the room, and then, finally, at Floyd. The first thing he saw was a golden shimmer. It was not the light bulb. It was the reflection of Floyd's tooth. His mouth hung open. He was dead. 
Brenner was helped out of the cave and he delivered the news. Dead. A coroner would later state that Floyd succumbed to exposure and that they had missed him by just three days, about the same time that the light bulb had gone out. But what would they do now with the body? The shaft walls were ready to fall inwards and risking lives to remove a corpse was seen as just irresponsible. So the following morning, officials made a decision. Floyd would be entombed where he lay. The cave would keep its victim. Now this did not sit well with the family, but what could they do? The next day, they planned a funeral. The town needed people. And the shaft with Floyd at the bottom was refilled with soil. But that's not quite the end of the story. But if you hung on for this long, keep holding on, because things are going to continue to get interesting. But first, let me do a wrap up for where everyone is and all that stuff. Context, context. The Collins family already had financial hardship. Locals saw old man Lee scouring the rescue site for glass bottles. But the owner of the land, B. Doyle, a supposed friend of Lloyd, was wholly unsympathetic. He erected a sign on the highway which said, 200 yards away, the body of Floyd Collins not was imprisoned not in not Sam Cave. Ah. Then he began charging tourists 50 cents apiece for the opportunity to gander into the hole. 100 years later, he's dead. Let's call it him. Also, remember those claims of Kentucky being an open purse? Well, the state reneged on the deal. They refused to pay many of the rescuers, and most of them went home without any compensation. Some of them did make some money out of the situation, though. They lucked into vaudeville gigs and roamed the country, giving their first-person account. Miller, however, received an astonishing offer, a $50,000 contract from the Chautauqua Lecture Center, equivalent to the best part of a million dollars in today's money. He declined. He continued to work at the Louisville Court Journal. The following year, his coverage of Floyd's story earned him the Pulitzer Prize. And his brother, Homer, he needed money and he agreed to do that vaudeville circuit. He stood on stage and regaled the audience with up tales of his brother, their childhood, and their tragedy. But Homer made it known why he was up here on stage trying to get money. He had a mission. I kept thinking of Floyd lying in the mud, for he had suffered beyond our power to imagine. I would never have peace of mind if you remain there. He wanted the money to dig Floyd up and get him out of that cave. A couple of months later, he had it. All right, so back to Floyd. April 17th, 1925. Seven miners showed up to the scene. They began to dig. Within a week, they had arrived at Floyd. And this time, they approached from the other side of the rock formation. That way, they could remove the rock pinning Floyd's leg. They lifted him up from his tomb and laid him down on the fresh air. Up. April 26, 1925. Floyd was set to rest in the family cemetery. A stalagmite had been set as a headstone to mark out his plot. And there he lay. For no, that's not actually where it ends. Okay, this is where it gets weird. Two years later, 1927. Times have been tough for the Collins. So Floyd's dad sold Sand Cave to a dentist named Dr. Harry B. Thomas for $10,000. Homer begged him not to because at the time the government was starting to buy up tons of land in the area and turn it into national parks. They had to pay at a very competitive rate. But Lee was becoming a bit old and senile by this point and frankly it's doubtful that he cared about Homer or Floyd or anyone else for that matter. It's 100 years later He's dead now, let's call it in. So, the point is, in this land sale with Thomas, Lee agreed to a very odd clause. And that clause said, everything on that property belongs to Thomas. And should he wish, for example, to exhume a dead one and re-embalm it and put it on display in something really tacky like a, I don't know, a glass coffin inside a cave, maybe, then that would be his prerogative. Lee signed, yes. And Thomas did exactly that. Doyle made Floyd's corpse a tourist attraction. 
That's right. Two bits of gander. Come and wander at the incredible dead man and hide in a cave. Now, to add insult to injury, it worked. Visitors return to Sand Cave to gawk morbidly at Floyd. Within a few months, Thomas had turned Lee's failing farm into a successful business. And the rest of Colin's family is horrified. They try a number of times to get Floyd returned to them, including through the legal system. But somehow, incredibly, the judge ruled in Thomas's favor. And so, there he lay for the next two years. The cave was not done with Floyd. Until someone hatched up like two years later. It's midnight, outside Sam Camp. Footsteps can be heard rustling through the brush. Now we don't know who these two men are, but we know why they are here. To rob a grave. They sneak inside and clamor over the rocks in the darkness. Reaching Floyd's casket, they undo the latch and throw open the lid. There is his shriveled body. They throw him in a gunny sack and they race off into the night. For 800 yards they carry dear Floyd like a couple of sweaty Santas about to deliver a really terrible Christmas present. Panting, out of breath, knowing that they're going to get caught any minute, they reach the Kentucky Green River hillside. There's no time! With a one, two, three, they launch his body towards the river and Floyd goes sailing into the air. Up, up into the starlit beyond and landing in a bush oh god the two men flee from the scene now the next morning Thomas notices that the body of Floyd is somewhat missing and he contacts the authorities the police come they dust the casket for fingerprints and bloodhounds are given Floyd's scent and let loose into the hillside. A few hours later, they managed to find him. He tangled up mess near the river, but this time with a leg missing, that same one that was trapped under the rock. So, despite his protest, it had been amputated. Neither the leg nor the culprits were ever found. And while it would be nice to think that this was some well-intentioned duo that did this out of the kindness of their hearts to free Floyd, it's much more likely that it was an act of vandalism because Floyd was simply too much of a hot tourist attraction. The following day, Floyd was passed back into the cave, back into his box, and it was covered by a metal lid, surrounded by a metal chain, and locked with a padlock. He was now more trapped than he had ever been. This cave had spun fate once again to make sure that its victim would never live. And so, time passed. Floyd's body would continue to decay. The rot from his body would eventually rot the casket too. In every decade or so, it would need to be replaced. A few years later, he was no longer on display. But even then, he remained in that box for many more years. In 1961, Floyd's Cave was purchased by Mammoth Cave National Park, and it was closed to the public. There would be no more visitors. The entrance itself to Floyd's Cave was closed with a steel gate and bolted, then welded shut. But the Collins family never gave up objecting to Collins' body being left in the cave. And here is where the story ends. In 1989, at the Collins' request, the National Park Service ventured into Floyd's cave. Continuing on a more than 60-year tradition, a team of people worked over the course of several days to remove him from the cave. They took him out, left the cave, locked it behind them, and laid Floyd to rest at the Mammoth Cave Baptist Church Cemetery. After 64 years in Sam Cave, he is now finally at peace. The M. Thank you to Wendigoon as Floyd. If you don't let me out, I'm going to hire a gang of hitmen to come to your house and kill your family. Samito as Homer. The 
that has I'm hungry. Yeah, shut the fuck up. Ordinary things as Miller. I'm enthusiastic, but would ultimately dock out the back exit. Rusty Cage as Gerald. Oh, well, hello there. I haven't seen y'all in a while. Welcome to my new home. And many kudos as Burden. Hey, hey buddy. You're right down there. Are you sleepy? Yeah, yeah. Need your coffee? Need a cup, a cup of Joe? A cup of Joseph? Also, by the way, in case you're confused about the channels, this is how it works now. And do not forget, World of Tanks, World of Tanks, none of this would have happened if Floyd had got World of Tanks. I've been running around this endgame abandoned temple map for a while now and have a guess what small gameplay mechanic they've forgotten to add. I just realized it took about 20 minutes to notice, but there is something missing from this map. Enemies. They forgot to add the enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Strike Hayes, and this is Worst MMO Ever, a series where I play the worst MMO games I can find, so you don't have to. If you're enjoying the series, then drop a like on the video, sub to the channel, or ring the bell for all the future notifications. And as usual, a big thank you to all the Patreon supporters and Twitch subs. I am determined to list every Patreon name on a single card, and I will keep reducing the font size no matter how small it gets. Today, we are playing Arcfall an early access MMO available on Steam. Before you go all commenting about how I shouldn't be reviewing an early access game, it's been in early access for just over four years and has a very expansive in-game cash shop. In my mind, if you're open to the public and you're actively taking money through an in-game cash shop, you aren't early access anymore. You've released. The entire game is only 4.5 gigabytes, so let's see what they've got. Well, character creation is a bit... Warcrafty, same blocky, chunky character model, it's often considered a bad idea to copy an extremely recognizable graphical style. Because you'll invite comparisons, and unless you are the better choice, comparisons are not a thing you want. Naming the character, Josh Strife Hayes, obviously, but no, your name must be under 15 characters. Then why did you let me write more than 15 characters? Why do games have this system? If you're going to limit the name, don't let me write a name over for the limit. Not the best first impression again. The game loads and I don't know if I like the logo or not. It seems both classic fantasy and very amateurish at the same time. I think it's the thick outlines of the letters and how they connect in on themselves at certain points. I'm not a fan. Game begins and wow. Well, discount, wow. Specifically, it is just cheap World of Warcraft. W, A, S, D, movement, space to jump, but oh, fantastic. The jump animation three times to the jumping mechanical movement. So if you hold spacebar, you'll repeatedly jump, but the movement of the jump will very slowly creep out of sync with the model jump animation. And eventually you'll be in the air when you start the jump movement. Oh, just fantastic. Is there voice acting? Yes, there is. It's basic, but it's there. Norman needs me to go and find some boxes. Quick glance at the map and it looks basic, but we will come back to this later, because it gets really, really bad when you actually critique it. So the UI looks acceptable. Portrait to the top left, although again, another MMO where my portrait looks nothing like my actual avatar. My avatar in-game has a brown hair and brown beard. The portrait is bald. How hard is it to make these match up? I can also see my hit points, my Anna and oh, a hunger bar! Terrific! It's another MMO with a hunger mechanic because they've always been known to make games consistently more fun. The first UI I thought it off right is shop, so let's have a look at what the game thinks it's worth. Remember, you can cry early access all you like, but you are available to download and have a working shop. You are open to scrutiny. The premium currency are crowns because someone played the Elder Scrolls online, and you can buy everything from cosmetics to pets to mounts, and 1,000 crowns. Crowns will set you back $56, and the best mount is 800 crowns. So this is a $56 dragon mount in an early access game. Fantastic. I will not be buying it. The character equipment menu is also odd. I was expecting an image of the avatar and then location slots arranged around the body close to that location, but no, it's just a grid. A grid of equipped items. The skill menu shows us three major combat styles, swordsmanship, majory, and archery, because someone also played runescape. I will give them all a go later, but right now I want to rebind some keys, because it's done that thing where A and D are turn left or turn right, and I want to rebind them to be straight. So let's see how 
easy that is. Oh good, it's one of those difficult systems. You cannot rebind a key that's already bound to something else, but now watch this. I have to rebind A and D to some other random keys to free them up so I can make A and D straight. So I try and bind A and D to NumLock, but NumLock is currently the auto run key. And when I press it to rebind, despite being on the key rebind screen, it starts auto run. It actually activates the key's bound function while you're pressing them to rebind them. This shouldn't happen. Right, with all the keys ready and me a lot further away than I was because I've auto ran the entire time I was binding, let's actually play. My first quest is to collect some boxes from the beach. Quests are accepted from NPCs and added to your journal. The journal doesn't show you any quest map markings or any UI quest location markings. It doesn't even record down who gave you the quest or where you turn it in sometimes. You have to just remember the location, who gave it you and where you need to finish. Also, there's no quest journal UI overlay or quest list heads up this way. You need to keep opening the actual journal whenever you're meant to be doing anything. And there's no level suggestions. It's just like, hey, here's a quest to accept it. Hope you can remember where you're meant to be going. Collect some boxes, get some crafting materials from the mine, think, and then return to Norman. Good thing I remembered where Norman was. I forget where NPC is. It might take me quite some time to finish a quest. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Okay, let's examine this map some more. And if you're making an MMO, pay attention because this is how not to make a map. Clicking the map icon right to the top right does. That's right. Nothing. Literally nothing. The mini map is always visible. And clicking the little icon doesn't change anything. The icon flashes, of course, to acknowledge it's been clicked, but no, it doesn't do anything. Clicking every other icon opens or closes the window, not the map. To open the map, you must press M. With the map expanded, you can hover your cursor over it and scroll the mouse wheel backward and forward. Guess what that does? That's right, nothing. You cannot use the mouse wheel to change the zoom level. You have to click the little plus and minus icons on the right hand side. What do you think the plus icon does? That's right, it zooms you out. And of course the minus icon zooms you in. Marvel at how much the zoom changes with each click of the wrong button. Also, you cannot click and hold these buttons. You must click every time for every minute change of zoom. There is another stupid map mechanic, but we will see that later. Another quest sees me heading to take the bank key to the banker. So you just gave me the key to the whole bank. Great decision making there, game. No way that could go wrong. Also, sound designers, we need to talk about cicadas. I know you just goddamn love you some cicada because it's the international sound of it's outside and there's trees, but maybe tone it down a notch because right now your game sounds like this. Welcome. Let's have a glance around the inventory because I got some equipment and a quest. And oh, there's a stone! It returns you home. It returns you to your hearth, you could say. That's what it's called. That's right. Hearthstone. It's like you're not even trying anymore, game. Now we meet the blacksmith and here begins the real game. Crafting stuff. Arc 4 is basically a game about making things. And this is the start of our endless cycle. We first need to buy a blueprint from whatever crafting tutor is nearby, and then interact with the crafting station brings up the crafting menu for that particular discipline. You can see the recipes you know and the required items for each recipe. A quick quality of life suggestion game. Crafting interfaces should show you both the amount of an item you need and the amount you have on you. Because right now I'm having to glance from the crafting window on the left on the right and double check everything. Now, all the materials I'm asking you for, I remember getting from those crates on the beach. So let's go back to the crates. So I'm collecting some boxes and getting random low level crafting materials, but there is another major issue. You cannot open the blacksmithing interface to double check the material amounts needed. And you can't access the info through your crafting skill interface either. The blacksmithing skill book just tells me what levels I unlock various things at. It doesn't list any recipes I need know all the materials I need for those recipes. The only way to get the info for what you actually need for a certain recipe is by being at the crafting station and checking the recipe. You need to memorize all the ingredients you need, then go out into the world and get them. When you're in the world, there's no way to check. Oh, and as we're also by the water, how is the swimming? 
one is fine, actually. Finally bring all the material to the smith and make an axe, then get the guy. Got some blacksmithing experience for my troubles. So there's no real quest line. There's no adventure line to follow specifically. It's more a case of explore around and see what pops up. And while I like the adventure and explore aspect, I like the freedom to go and do whatever I want, I also like it when games do have a basic early game structure to them so you can choose to follow it if you like. A set adventure line to guide new players through the early steps. This is much more freeform. They are clearly going for the more experienced MMO crowd and making the quest harder to find and harder to track. But they're also making the quests very generic starter quests. If you're aiming for the more old school hardcore MMO crowd by removing guidance, you might also want to make the quest lines hardcore to match instead of the standard go and kill five sheep. And I'm not exaggerating, the next battle line is literally kill five sheep. So combat, ready for it? Here we go. So it's click and wait. There are abilities, but you unlock them as you level up a specific combat skill line. You will start with a sword and a magic book. You can swap the book in combat. The mage book is a ranged magical energy attack, and it doesn't do anywhere near as much damage as the sword, although you can cast it while moving, which is a nice touch. I level up my sword and chip with my first skill, a very cheap, very spammable stab that does a set amount of damage and happens instantly with a one second cooldown, and suddenly melee is broken. This is stupid. The speed you can spam your first skill at increases your damage over a basic attack is insane. You go from 0 to 100 in one skill. I've gone from hitting 7 to hitting 20 every few seconds. After killing the sheep, I need to skin them, but this needs a knife. I wonder if I can make one at the blacksmith's table. Blueprint seller, and yes, I can. I buy the blueprint, so I can make a knife. But to do this needs metal scraps. So I buy metal scraps blueprint. But to make metal scraps, I need metal pebbles. And it just so happens that Boris has a quest for me. He needs metal scraps too, made from metal pebbles. Found on the beach. Sweet. Two birds, one metal pebble. And here begins the grind. The metal pebbles are resource spawns on the beach. There are other players around, amazingly, and the resource spots are shared. So we are racing for them. And then I'm carrying too much weight, and the movement slows. So let's talk about the weight limit. You have a weight limit, but the game doesn't tell you what it is. If you open your inventory, there's nothing, no indication at all. Now on your couch, on the second edge, something you've got no reason to go to, you can see your current carried weight. But nowhere does the game show you your actual carry limit. You just need to drop things until you're under the limit. And because the entire opening of the game is collect resources to craft stuff, you will be over encumbered a lot. Finally, make the knife, kill the sheep, skin them, and the game sends me to Jordan the Clothmaker. As the quest journal says, it's just past the sheep. And this I really like. Using an actual in-game graphical reference, the type a real direction in a real small village would use. This helps you spot landmarks and understand the layout of the village in relation to other parts. Using in-game descriptors for in-game travel is good. I quest around for a while. This dude wants me to collect some sticks from the beach. These sticks that are literally right in front of him. And again, I am over encumbered from a stick. Another quest asked me to go and kill forest imps over on Skell Ridge. I check the map and yes, Skell Ridge is north. Again, this is good. You've given the player all the information they need to find the place by themselves. I'll try and do some of the local quests first because in my experience, the further you venture away from the starting location, the more dangerous the world will get. The first few quests all need me to collect local resources and make me various things at the local crafting station, so I've been picking up random stuff for about an hour now. And once you've got the raw material, the crafting process takes a while as well. I've been picking up metal pebbles to turn into scrap, and you turn two pebbles into one scrap metal every four seconds. So you can often find yourself stood at the crafting table for several minutes at a time just watching the bars fill up. So after all of that grind, I finally managed to make a wooden sword and... 
What, do you want five of them? You are having a laugh, mate. It took me ages to make one. No, I will come back to this later if I am desperate. I need some combat to distract me from the monotony of crafting. I've been assigned to kill some bandits, so it's nice to see this bandit starting a fight in the traditional bandit way of violently vibrating up to me. So combat in this game is buggy and inconsistent. You see, I open the fight with the stab ability, and you'd assume once the ability is used, the auto attack takes over, right? Well. Kind of. The ability's range is longer than auto attack, so once the ability ends, I just kind of stand there. The bandit can hit me, I just can't hit him until I step forward. The auto attack goes, oh, yep, I know what I should do. And when he dies, sometimes looting just doesn't. I mean, you can click and the animation happens, but nothing actually gets looted for a couple of seconds. Some more bandits attack me and then just run off in the middle of the fight. Why? So let's see what happens when you die. So I die on purpose, and you respawn at a graveyard. Nice touch with the coffin, actually. And all your items lose durability. Right, so it's basically World of Warcraft, but back. Take a swim over to the island and fight the imps. And is it just me, or does this imp sound effect not match the imp monster model at all? The imps are small. I do not expect a deep, bassy noise from them. Just this, this, in my mind, it doesn't make sense. Well, despite having a dumb noise, three imps swarm me and I die. Legitimately, this time I actually get killed. The combat is not die. easy for the unprepared adventurer. I wonder if the abbey I spawn at has any questions. Ah, they do. They want me to kill some bandits. Oh, that I can do. But while I'm on my way, I get curious. How big is the map? Not the YouTuber, although he's a great YouTuber. How big is this actual map? And where is the most distant land? Map? So I take a map and... Yeah, it's a big world. But annoyingly, you cannot full screen the map. And the only way to navigate it is by dragging it around bit by bit. And you can't zoom out enough to see it all at once. And then, here is the dumbest part. And this is proof that you were at one point meant to be able to do it all at once. In the top right, there is a key. A list of icons and their meanings. But you can only see it when you drag all the way to it. A key is only useful if you can see it and the map icons it relates to at the same time. This is awful! Why on earth have you made the map be like this? Of all the things that you didn't copy from Warcraft, Warcraft nailed map design. You should have copied that. So let's kill some bandits and... Oh, right, they're a bit tougher when there's two of them. Okay, I guess I am grinding for some levels first. Let's do all the crafting quests I can find, which means I am back to collecting metal pebbles to make those stupid swords. Arkfall has a nice enough graphical style and a nice enough world that you actually do want to explore it, but it's also so brutal that you need to prepare, so new players to Arkfall need to spend several hours gearing up and grinding the boring crafting bits, competing with each other for resources before they can go adventuring. It takes about 15 minutes to pick up 40 pebbles when there is no one competing with me, and then a few more minutes to craft them into scraps, and I'm still less than halfway to finishing this order of sorts. There are six pebbles formed, and if you're lucky enough to have all of them, you can time a nice route, but I'm also cutting down the tree. Oh, small issue, if you flick the tree while you're cutting it, it says, another player is using that. They're not. I am. But finally, I craft all the materials into swords, and I gain a tiny amount of smithing experience. Wow, this was a waste of time. Right, back to the bandits, I'll just kill them one at a time. And now, combat begins to lag. Badly. And it will only get worse from here. The collecting and crafting and movement is all buttery smooth, but the moment combat begins... Uh oh guess what? Lag. Intense lag. And I can only kill one bandit at a time, so I'm fighting, lagging, healing. Fighting, lagging, healing. You heal just by waiting. If you quit here because of combat lag, no one would blame you. It's also becoming a hand, and I need armor. So let's go and see if I can make some. Um, throat, are you okay? Do you need me to call someone? I can fetch help. No? Okay, well, you do you, little boat. You do you. And there's the thumbnail. Beautiful. 
Just beautiful. Ah, an archery store. Well, I've not done archery yet, so let's give it a go. I need to make a bow, so I buy the bow blueprint. And now I need some wood and some string. And I make string by killing sheep and swinging the wool they drop at the clothier. There really is a lot of running back and forth between crafting stations. And you have arrows, so I need 20 logs and 20 chicken feathers, so even more crafting. Here's a glitch. On the inventory is a repair item button, and clicking it turns your cursor into a little button. But if your cursor then hovers over an equipped item, or an in-game enemy, or literally anything it decides it doesn't like, it disappears. It's still technically there, because I can see the tooltip popping up as I move the cursor around where it should be, but it's invisible. And this happens randomly whenever you're trying to repair anything. It is incredibly annoying. So I check the blacksmith, and then the tanner for armor. Both of them need me to be a higher level and have better crafting skills. So there's a lot of early game grind needed to get the items you need to do the early game grind. At the bandits, I bump into another player. And we group up to take some damage. It goes a lot smoother with two people. It's still laggy as hell. Wherever you are, Christicus, I hope you're having a nice day. After leveling my archery up, I need a better bow. So it's time for some more wood. But the wood cutting animation doesn't remove your equipped bow. So just excuse me for a moment while I smack my bow against this tree. I need three bow crafting to make a better bow, and the only way to train bow crafting is to make the crap bows, and making a single crap bow takes a while, so no, I'll just make do with what I've got. I try magic to take down the bandits. It is terrible. Slow and weak. Magic is an awful idea. But then I discover the best thing ever. You can collect the boxes and shoot the bandits from the water, and they can't retaliate. Oh, this is so much safer. And it's giving me archery experience. Oh, this is just great. Arkfall is a totally balanced game with no exploits. I'm finally able to make it across the end of the island. There are skeletons guarding a cave. Ooh, let's try and kill one. And nope, they are way too tough. Let's run away. I spent about two hours just grinding, picking up materials, making them into stuff, fighting weak enemies, slowly gaining levels. And while I'm doing that, let's just have a read of some of the views. The game has a lot of potential. I've been very surprised at the amount of content I've actually come across. There are not many guides, and you pretty much have to figure out the magic system alone. For me, this is part of what keeps bringing me back. I hope to see the population grow in the future. I can't recommend this in its current state. Maybe in time, it could be decent. It's worth trying to follow, but it lacks a lot of content and direction. This is a grind game. Lots of skills, crafting, gathering, killing. Devs are super active and are ramping up patches and new content. Great game. Pre-alpha for nearly three years. And the optimization is so horribly bad that it's basically unplayable. This game is not going to go anywhere. Don't waste your time. So after using the bow for a while and discovering it both sucks in damage compared to the sword and is limited by arrows, I've been focusing on making a better sword. And the next upgrade is the level 5 stone sword. So I've been grinding away to gather resources and gathering my swords and shit by stabbing sheep. And finally I hit level 5. So let's take this for a test drive. Okay, wow. The wooden sword was doing 15 to 25 damage. This thing is smacking for 80 to 110. And that is a bit of a jump. Right. Okay, this is what we need. Let's see the bandits and the imps deal with this. And right, okay, while I do indeed win the fight through using auto attack, the lag has gotten worse. Just this is what a three on one fight looks like now. And I'm only winning because auto attack is still happening when I can't click. And again, I still die if I get piled. I've got the damage, but not the defense. I also don't get this lag. Where's it coming from? The game is using 2 gigabytes of RAM and 15% of the CPU. It's not a resource hog. It's just lagging in combat. I mean, look, taking on the skeletons in the cave, a fight where I need to use the right ability at the right time to win, and it's just this is bordering on unplayable now. If you were a new player, you would quit. And here's another combat issue, a pretty bad one actually. Your abilities do static damage, not weapon scaled damage. Meaning my do 25 damage spammable ability was great when my sword was hitting for 10, but now my auto attack hits for 100. Meaning using that ability actually does less damage. A great way to make abilities useless once you upgrade weapons. I hand in all the quests I can and you know what, I want to explore. I want to see how hard the game can be. Let's go on an adventure to the far-flung lands. Down at the docks there's a travel 
all NPC. You can buy tickets to get to various places, and the most expensive place is Caldemore. So it would be reasonable to assume that Caldemore is the furthest away, and the furthest away is also likely the highest level. Caldemore isn't even on this map, it's an entirely new map, so let's see where we end up. Ooh, it's a Mayan-inspired map, because someone on the dev team